subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell icon. So uh, we have uh, the full number maximum to our capacity and we will just start with the, with the with welcoming everybody and a very good evening to all of you and uh, a big welcome. Thank you for taking interest in this webinar. We are deeply honored to have with us our e-chief guest, Honorable Miss Justice Seema Kohli ma'am. Our guests of honor, Honorable Justice Pratibha Singh. Uh, Miss, uh, Honorable Miss Justice uh, Rekha Palli was, about, was also to join us, but uh, we can't see her as of now. Uh, thank you so much, your ladyships, for gracing this occasion and uh, uh, giving us the much needed support. We all welcome Ms. Manindar Acharya, senior advocate and currently the learned ASG, who is the esteemed president for our organization. In September 2014, a group of highly empowered ladies got together and conceived of a platform uh, because they thought it was specially needed for women lawyers and litigants so as to enable them to uh, get mentorships from their seniors to be able to navigate through the disparity discrimination the issues of the issues which uh, all of us women sometimes do face uh, in our professional lives in our in our struggles to be recognized and uh, be uh, there uh, this platform, uh, which is now called Women in Law and Litigation, was formed. The, the organization was led by Honorable Miss Justice Seema Kohli as the chief patron. And it was the other uh, women were uh, the other uh, uh, honorable women who were there to support it and to create an organization were Miss Manindar Acharya, who is our president uh, currently. Uh, Ms. Rebecca John, the senior advocate, uh, Ms. Manisha Deer, a senior member of the bar, and uh, now uh, we have uh, the support of Honorable Ms. Justice Rekha Pali as our esteemed patron. Uh, Honorable Ms. Justice Pratibha Singh has, she was our then uh, Secretary General, and now she has uh, been elevated and is our uh, esteemed patron. We are also joined by Ms. Tara Ganju, who has uh, brought in so much of uh, 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 enthusiasm in the entire group, and uh, with her dynamism, we are able to uh, make make uh, a way for larger events and uh, counseling sessions, seminars. We've already done three, four of them, and uh, we hope that uh, after this webinar, which is our first one, we will be able to uh, have many more for you. Especially during the lockdown, we have decided we'll have uh, uh, webinars which would be once a week, and maybe thereafter we can have physical seminars once again. So I welcome all of you again, and I request uh, uh, Her Ladyship, uh, Honorable Ms. Justice Hima Kohli, to say a few words to us. Thank you. Thank you, Kadamri. That was a quick introduction of uh, WILL and what WILL stands for. It's really nice to see all of you here together and, uh, and joining the webinar. It's been quite a while since you met in person. And thanks to COVID-19, we are locked down. What could be better than this IT platform for us to talk to each other, to share views, to exchange uh, information, and most of all, to learn um, various aspects of law as you're, we're going to do today by hearing uh, um, Mr. Rebecca John, senior advocate, and speaking on the art of process examination in criminal trials, a uh, critical area. Just to update you on what we as High Court has been doing in this short while, which is just as an aside, and uh, not just specifically for Will, but all of us, uh, we've been trying uh, very hard to activate the court even during the lockdown. And uh, you'll be happy to hear that uh, this is one.
and uh, a genre that is kind of much a Western sense of uh, which we uh, conducting matters next week and we might. They want to express it ourselves. We also had a lot of uh, Ma'am, sorry to sorry to interrupt you, ma'am. Your voice has become a little low. All right, is it better? Yes, ma'am. I think you need to come closer to wherever the mic is. Oh, I'm closer to the mic. You can't hear me. I'll oh, I, th I think I think uh, please mute everybody and switch off everybody's videos except ma'am's because that uh, will enhance the uh, reception. So shall okay. I? Just one second, ma'am. Yes. Yes, and I am allowing all, ma'am, all participants. Uh, Mega, are you scrolling up and down because I've lost ma'am now? Sorry, just one second, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, now maybe. Okay. okay. Yes. So I'll continue now. Am I loud enough? Is it clear? Can you hear me? It's clearly? not loud, ma'am. It's, it's clear, but it's not loud, in, loud enough. Okay, I think I'll speak louder then. If I can yes. speak louder, it'll be better. Yeah? So now I'm, I'm starting on this again. That uh, we and I have had a good experience conducting masters in the world of music. And uh, we would think that this is um, a challenge that has been taken very well by uh, most of us in the high court, both the bar and the bench. We propose to take it further. After perhaps whenever the lockdown is uh, over, because we think that the uh, IT and other things will work better, and we'll all have to move with it whichever way. So, this webinar is going to be a, a wonderful opportunity for people to connect. And as uh, Kalpa said, I'm happy to know that the Bureau and I could be involved in getting uh, people uh, going to do things on the uh, platform and clients. Idea to connect. I look forward to doing many different events. But it didn't mean all of you who have some difficult and are willing to learn. So, a heartening thing that more than 100 participants have applied to be part of the And we hope that those who are not part of the group time will be included another time. I hand it back to Kanda to take, to take the uh, meeting for me. Ma'am, yeah. I think Kadumri. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, now uh, I would uh, request Tara Danju to introduce uh, the speaker and also to take forward the uh, webinar. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, um, good evening, Justice Kohli, Justice Padima Singh again. I'm hoping we can get uh, Justice Pali, but uh, we need to continue. Uh, thanks, Kadumri, for doing this. Now, I've been uh, today interested. Uh, the task of introducing our speaker today, Ms. Rebecca Mamon John, senior advocate, who is also our vice president of Will. Um, honestly, Ms. Uh, Ms. John really needs no introduction, but just let me just say a few things I'm sure most of you already know about. Uh, designated as a senior advocate in 2013, our distinguished speaker for today, Ms. Rebecca Mamon John, enrolled with the bar in 1988. She's been practicing on the criminal side of the Supreme Court of India, the High Court of Delhi, and in the trial courts of Delhi for more than three decades. She's conducted a wide of criminal trials dealing with offenses under the Banking and Commercial Transaction Customs Act, FERA, the Prevention of Corruption Act, I beg your pardon, the Prevention of Food Adulteration, Excise Act, the Prevention of Money Laundering, uh, PMLA, and of course the IPC. Over the years, She's represented the accused as well as victims during trials amongst the long list of cases to her, her credit are the Jain Hawala cases of 1996, the 2G Spectrum case, Arushi Kalwar murder case, Hashimpur massacre case, and the defamation case filed against Priya Ramani, and also the Ankit Saxena murder case, where she's been appointed as a special public prosecutor among others, many others. An appellate lawyer with a vast trial court experience is what distinguishes our speaker today. It's an indeed an honor to have her with us today to address you all on the topic, the art of cross-examination and criminal trials. Over to Ms. John. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, everyone. I know you've been waiting for a very long time, to, so I'll start uh, immediately without wasting more time. 
cross examination in criminal trials that's the topic for today um so cross examination is one of the most visible aspects of a criminal trial thanks to its pervasive presence across popular culture so it's considered the most glamorous aspect of a criminal trial uh it's exciting it's daunting um and it's uh it's sometimes the most the most difficult aspect of of criminal trial but cross examination own is not the only part of a criminal trial a trial actually begins with the arrest of an accused the demand uh, his production in court various stages during investigation his presence in court as an accused when he summoned uh, thereafter frequent charges leading up to the evidence cross examination statement under 313 and defense with uh, and defense evidence if any therefore to isolate cross examination and simply look at cross examination as a stand alone uh, step in this whole uh, process of criminal trial would be a fallacy and it is uh, therefore um, my uh, my request to all young lawyers here to treat cross examination holistically with all other aspects of Randy, the trial amazing. because if you were to delink cross examination from the other aspects you will not be an effective cross examiner now to understand cross examination it is very important for us to understand what is evidence now evidence has been defined in section 3 of the indian evidence act and it includes all statements which the court permits or requires to be made before it by witnesses as well as all documents including electronic records produced for the inspection of the court such documents are called documentary evidence now therefore as per section 3 and going from section 3 where it talks of statements and documents this can be further subdivided into various heads for example statements and to to understand what statements mean we need to look at sections 59 and 60 of the indian evidence act which talk of oral evidence and oral i'll come to it in a bit documentary evidence is defined from sections 61 to 90a of the indian evidence act coming back to statements or oral evidence direct evidence is something that is defined under section 60 circumstantial evidence is evidence that criminal lawyers are very familiar with evidence which may not be direct but which are circumstantial in nature and which can also be very important for the purposes of ascertaining the guilt or innocence of a particular person now if you were to read section 59 and 60 in particular section 60 of the indian evidence act which actually tells you what direct evidence is what oral evidence is all about it says oral evidence must be direct so oral evidence must in all cases be direct if it refers to a fact which can be seen it must be evidence of a witness who says he saw it if it refers to a fact which can be heard it must be evidence of a witness who says he heard it if it refers to a uh, to a fact which could be perceived by any other sense or in any other manner it must be evidence of a witness who says he perceived it if it refers to an opinion or to the grounds on which the opinion is held it must be the uh, evidence of the person who holds that opinion on those grounds so oral evidence must be direct evidence what you've seen what you've heard what you perceived if you are a expert witness then of course your opinion uh uh documentary evidence again uh we have primary evidence in section 62 of the indian evidence act which is the document itself and secondary evidence which is defined in section 63 of the indian evidence act where uh, and section 63 has to be read with section 65 where the original document is for some reason not available before a court either because of its bulk it cannot be produced before the court or because it has been lost or it has perished or it has otherwise been destroyed but you have an exact facsimile of that document then you bring in a sec you bring in evidence through secondary means there is a process by which secondary evidence is led and that process must be complied before it is uh, before such evidence can be uh, can be admitted so this in a sense is the structure of evidence evidence which is direct which is circumstantial documents which is primary which is secondary 
even amongst documents which is secondary, you have now electronic evidence and there is a whole uh, different manner in which you prove electronic evidence. The most important uh, bit of it is part of Section 65B of the Indian Evidence Act. Unless you know what is direct evidence, what is circumstantial evidence, what is primary evidence, what is secondary evidence, the evidence led by the prosecuting side will not be understood by you. Because as important as it is to cross-examine a witness to the best of your ability, it is equally important for you to, uh, to look at the evidence led by the prosecution and to determine which aspects of that evidence is admissible or not. Therefore, you need to be very, very vigilant. People look at examination in chiefs as though it's something that can happen and that you don't need to engage with it. Examination in chief is as crucial as cross-examination. An alert cross-examiner will make relevant objections to those portions of the examination in chief which are otherwise inadmissible in evidence. Uh, now, uh, in a case which was decided by the Delhi High Court, it's called Ripin Kumar versus Customs Department, 2001, Criminal Law Journal 1288. It's a division bench uh, judgment of our court. Our court has held that evidence is chief cross and re-examination, if any. This whole, all of them together constitutes evidence, which is why I said, we cannot look at cross-examination in a standalone fashion. We have to interconnect it with the examination in chief and re-examination if necessary. And only then will our job as a cross-examiner be complete. Uh, Section 137 of the Indian Evidence Act says that examination in chief is the examination of a witness by a party who calls him. Cross-examination is, is, is the examination of that witness by the adverse party. Re-examination is the examination of a witness subsequent to cross-examination by the party who called him in the first place. Now, let's go to examination in chief. The examination in chief, for, if led by the prosecuting agency or the complainant as the case may be, can, aspects of that can be objected to. What are the legal objections you can give? Now, why I'm emphasizing on this is this, these objections are as much your duty as a lawyer, as a trial lawyer, and will enhance your cross-examination. If you allow inadmissible evidence to be recorded as evidence, then you've diminished your role as a cross-examiner. Cross Therefore, it is important for you to be vigilant and alert while the examination in chief is being recorded. What are the objections that, that you, can, you can possibly take while an examination in chief is, is being conducted? Uh, Section 60, as I said, uh, and I read out earlier, clearly says that evidence must be direct. So any evidence which is of a hearsay nature is per se inadmissible in evidence. So if a witness is not testifying to something which he or she has seen directly, heard, or perceived, then you can object to her or his evidence as being hit by the rule of hear hearsay. Uh, there is an exception to the rule of hearsay that is incorporated in section six of the Indian Evidence Act, which is popularly known as res geste. What does it mean? It basically means, and I'll give an example, suppose a witness, say a prosecutor, has told someone that, uh, has told a mother, that she's going out with somebody and her mother is aware or has seen her going out with that person. And she returns and says that that person took me to a room and raped me. Then the evidence of the mother, though not direct, is admissible under six, being evidence of res geste. Why? Because she has heard, uh, she has seen and heard events directly preceding and succeeding the actual offense. Uh, in uh, Krishan Kumar Malik versus State of Haryana, 2011, Volume 7, SCC, page 130, paragraphs 33 to 37, the Supreme Court has explained the meaning of Section 6. Section 6 of the Act has an exception, is an exception to the general rule 
where under hearsay evidence becomes admissible. As for bringing such evidence within the ambit of Section 6, what is required to be established is that it must be almost contemporaneous with the acts and there must not be an interval which would allow fabrication. In other words, statements made to be admitted as forming part of res geste must have been made immediately with, before or after the act. Admittedly, the prosecutrix had met her mother, Narayani, and sister soon after the occurrence. Thus, they could have been the best res geste witnesses. Still, the prosecution did not think it proper to have their statements recorded. So, while we object to hearsay evidence, we should be conscious of Section 6 and its application. Evidence which is of the nature of res geste is admissible if they fall within the parameters of Section 6. Another objection which you can take is the mode of proof. Photocopies are per se inadmissible in evidence. If a document is sought to be presented and proved in court, which document is a photocopy, and no attempt is made to lead secondary evidence as required under section 64 and 65 of the Indian Evidence Act, then you can object to the admissibility of that document. You can insist that the same be not um, uh, be only marked and not exhibited. And therefore, it is at a later stage, you will have to contest the evidentiary value of that document. There's enough law to say that photocopies are per se inadmissible in evidence. So that is another objection which you can, uh, which you can take. Electronic evidence, because it is of such great importance today, a lot of the evidence which is presented in court are actually electronic downloads, be it emails, be it CDR locations, be it, um, uh, be it WhatsApp messages, etc. All of all phone conversations or even video recordings, all of these must be accompanied by a 65B certificate. Be careful when the prosecution exhibits a 65B certificate. And I know the law on this has been changing, has, uh, there's been a pushback. But if you look at the true spirit and, uh, and reasoning behind Section 65B, what is important for the person who is presenting that evidence and presenting the document, the 65B certificate, that person must be able to prove that he or she was in direct control of the computer, must have to give uh, details of, of the computer, must say that the information derived is, uh, was regularly fed into the computer in the ordinary course of said activity, and that the information contained in the record is a reproduction or derivation from the information fed into the, in, into the computer. So 65B certificate, which is also exhibited as an evidence and without the certification under 65B, the electronic evidence can go, is an area where cross-examiners must focus on to see whether the elements of 65B have been fulfilled or not. Questions can be asked about it. If there is no, if there's no accompanying 65B certificate, you can object to the admissibility of the electronic record. The Delhi High Court in a landmark judgment called Sudhi Engineering uh, Company versus NITCO, which was passed in 1995 by Justice Lahoti, and subsequently there are judgments of the Supreme Court has said that mere marking or exhibition of a document, so even if a document is exhibited, it's not, it, is, it does not amount to proof. Uh, it is only for purposes of identification. So we should be conscious of this fact uh, Ideally, a document which falls short of proof should be marked, but merely because a document is exhibited, it doesn't mean that a challenge to its admissibility cannot be made later on. The competency of the witness. Now, a witness who is exhibiting a document but does not know anything about the contents of the document, is neither the scribe of the document or has no idea about the contents of the document. One can, one can, one can uh, object to its proof because the witness has no direct information about that document. So the contents of the document can only be proved by its author. That is another thing that you must keep in mind. Leading question. Now the prosecutor uh, cannot ask leading questions. Section 141 of the Indian Evidence Act clearly says 
that any question suggesting an answer is, if objected to by the other side, cannot be admitted. So that's another objection you can take, leading questions. Section 140, 142 is an, is an absolute embargo to asking of leading questions. Section 143 says that the only time leading questions can be asked is when the public prosecutor seeks to cross-examine his own witness. In ordinary parlance or in colloquial language, it means that when you declare a witness hostile, at that time, the prosecutor has the right to cross-examine the witness. At that time, he's entitled to ask leading questions. So this is, again, something that requires you to be very alert because it is very common for prosecutors to push in leading questions and get the witness to answer it because the answer is evident in the question itself. So leading questions must be another, uh, another objection that you can take. Uh, opinion of a witness. So if a witness who is a witness to a crime says, or is not a witness, is, is there for some reason, uh, is to give an opinion that I think this happened because of this, that is inadmissible in evidence. The only set of people who are entitled to give an opinion are those witnesses or those persons who have been specifically named in Section 45 of the Indian Evidence Act called expert evidence. So if you are a post-mortem doctor, you're a forensic specialist, you're a DNA doctor, uh, uh, you're, a, you're a handwriting examiner, your opinion evidence can be placed and can be read as evidence, but the opinion of some other normal witness who's not an expert, who doesn't come within the parameters of Section 45, such evidence must be eschewed from consideration. Uh, sections 45 to 51, in fact, of the Indian Evidence Act, in fact, is an exception to the rule that opinion evidence is inadmissible. These are persons who I said are post-mortem doctors and other specialists who are entitled to give their uh, give their uh, evidence, even though they have not directly seen a crime or a transaction. Another section that you may well uh, be aware of and you should be conscious of is section 293 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, which when read with section 45 makes a lot of sense. 293 says that certain reports uh, be that of the CFSL or uh, uh, of other forensic uh, experts, they are per se admissible in evidence. So even if somebody doesn't come to prove it, if the prosecution was to, uh, was to place it before court and give it an exhibit number, they are per se admissible in evidence. If that happens, then of course, the defense counsel can still move an application under 311 seeking the cross-examination of such witness because it is entirely possible that whatever the expert has said, you are seeking to contest it. Other objections that can be taken and must be taken. Always remember section 161 of the Code of Criminal Procedure which relates to the statement of a witness recorded by the police is per se and absolutely inadmissible in evidence. Section 162 makes that very, very clear. Uh, so any attempt made by the prosecuting side to get the witness to read his 161 statement in court or to get portions of the 161 statement exhibited has to be uh, disallowed and objections have to be raised to that extent. Disclosure statements. Uh, sections 25 to 27 of the Indian Evidence Act deal with statements made by the police, to, uh, statements made by a witness or, 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 or an accused to the police. Statements made by an accused to the police is inadmissible in evidence unless, as per section 27, it leads to the, uh, to the recovery of its fact or thing. So if I was to say I murdered X, that is inadmissible in evidence. But if I was to say I have placed the knife below the tree in front of my house, that portion of the evidence is admissible. Not the fact that I committed the murder, because that is a confession made to a police officer, but only that portion which leads to the discovery of a thing or a fact is admissible in evidence. So the habit of prosecuting agencies of exhibiting entire disclosure statements is again a habit which must be discouraged and vigilant cross-examiners should not allow that to be exhibited. 
uh, only if it has led to a discovery of a thing or fact should that portion be exhibited. Uh, the, so these are some of the objections that you can take at the time when the examination in chief is being is being recorded. Once the examination in chief is recorded, then you come to cross examination. Now, what is cross examination, and how do you prepare for cross examination? Uh, cross examination is the most powerful weapon in the hands of a defense counsel to discredit the version of the witness and to discredit the prosecution case as a whole. But as I said before, cross-examination must be interlinked to other aspects of the trial. And if you wake up one morning and think, oh, today this witness is coming and I'm going to ask him these 10 questions, it doesn't work that way. You have to understand, so what are, if you're preparing for the cross-examination of a witness, what is it that you're looking out for? Why is this witness coming in this case? What is his role? What is, his, what is, his, what is the purpose of his evidence? Is he an eyewitness? Is he testifying to some circumstantial piece of evidence? Is he a technical witness? Is he, uh, is he a witness to some fact that you are not disputing? When you, when you examine the chart sheet and the evidence and the list of statements and the statements under 161 as well, and correlated to the documents that every witness must prove, then uh, you must at that very stage make an assessment as to the use of this of, of a particular witness. What is the reason why the prosecutor is producing this witness? Uh, the objective of cross-examination is to test the truthfulness of the facts stated by the witness and examination in, uh, in chief, as also to discredit the witness by putting facts which are unfavorable to him. Uh, now, uh, if you do not cross-examine a witness, particularly a witness who is in some way uh, uh, important to the various links of the case, it will be treated as an admission on your side. If you were to read section 33 of the Indian Evidence Act, it's not a section with, that is read very often. And it's not entirely relevant to this case, but it, it tells you why uh, the legislators thought it important for evidence to include cross-examination. So in certain cases uh, emanating out of say the Customs Act or the Income Tax Act, in those proceedings, you have adjudicatory proceedings as well as proceedings in court. Now sometimes, in adjudic because adjudicatory proceedings are quasi-judicial in nature, even there, cross-examination is, is in, some, in some cases and at some stages allowed. Now if the prosecution in these cases wishes to place that uh, evidence before the court. Then what section 33 says is that you can rely on such statement. Now these are not for ordinary criminal trials, but in special trials, you can rely on such statements provided the adverse party had a chance to cross-examine that person. So that is the relevance of cross-examination. A statement minus cross-examination therefore will not be considered as evidence because as I said before, Evidence is examination, chief cross-examination, and re-examination. So absence of cross-examination on your part, unless it suits your case. Sometimes what a witness says entirely suits your case. So you needn't cross-examine him, and you needn't stir the hornet's nest and make him say something he hasn't said. That's a separate thing. But otherwise, the absence of cross-examination, particularly on material facts, if you will be treated as an admission on your side. Uh, essentially, other than this, cross-examination is important to test the veracity of the witness, to discover who he is, what is his position in life, to shake his credibility by injuring his character, um, etc., etc. Now, uh, as I said, how do you how do you prepare for uh, for cross-examination? Now, in a case where there are multiple accused, it is very important to carve out your role in the case. So you, let's take a murder case. Somebody is assigned the role of stabbing. Somebody else is assigned the role of catching hold of the accused. 
somebody else is assigned the role of exhortation. If you are the person who has been given the role of exhortation, which judgment after judgment says is a very weak piece of evidence, your cross-examination may not be the cross-examination of the uh, other persons. You're, you might be able to get away by not cross-examining some people, particularly if those persons have not said anything about your role pertaining to exhortation. So sometimes you choose not to cross-examine to enhance your case. So if the statement of the witness in examination chief does not condemn you in any way, does not incriminate you in any way, does not make you culpable in any way, does not remotely challenge your presence or your role in the case, then it's best not to cross-examine it. So that is something which you, 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 uh, is, is a decision you take either before, because you already have his, his, his transcript in the form of the 161 statement before you, or sometimes on the spot. I remember a case in which it was a murder case in which a particular witness was not to directly uh, in incriminate my client, but in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ancillary portion of her evidence in her 161, she had named my client to be present with her husband who was the deceased in the case uh, a day before the incident. In her chief, she didn't say anything about the previous days, uh, 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 pre uh, uh, about the fact that my client was with her husband on the previous day. For some reason, the prosecutor was not alert to the fact that she hadn't said it. You hold back the cross-examination. So although I had a list of, 200, of 100 questions, I didn't ask a single question because she did not incriminate me in chief. And that's an on-the-spot decision you take. So you have to be alert all the time to all the various facets of the case and not allow yourself to, uh, to sleep or to, be, uh, to, to not to be alert to, uh, to the facts and circumstances as being played out in court. Uh, the, so identify the purpose that the witness will serve. Be, uh, be aware of your own position. Are you contesting what he's saying? Or are you fine with the fact that he's saying what he's saying? That's a judgment call you have to take in the facts of your case. If you're contesting what you're saying, you have to cross-examine, even if it is to give him suggestions. But if you're not contesting what you're saying, what he's saying, then you can step back and say cross nip. And sometimes that's probably the best thing you can do for your client. Uh, the, uh, uh, what, one of the things I learned uh, uh, as, uh, uh, while I was learning trial under one of, uh, one of Delhi's legendary trial lawyers, Mr. Bipin Bihari Lal, um, was his what he was the way he used to prepare uh, before going in for a cross examination. And as a young uh, junior, I would say, Ask this, ask that. And he would look at me with disgust and say, Always remember that the question, the question you do not ask, is probably the most important question. What you leave behind sometimes is more relevant than what you ask. So it's, it's, it's a it's, there is no set formula to this, but you have to be careful about not making your position worse by asking questions and going straight into the trap laid down by the prosecution. So sometimes it's important for you to skirt around the issue and not come to the issue directly, because if you do that and you have, you, you've had a sense of the witness in court, you've observed him, you've seen how sharp he is, you therefore decide to pull back. Now, this is the other thing. Your observation of the witness in court, you must know the witness as well as you know your case. Because if you, you're seeing the witness for the first time, and if you find that the witness is a smart witness, an alert witness, alert to everything that he's saying, and is not going to get trapped by your questions, then it might be relevant to step back, to hold back, and not go full hog because he could do more damage to your case by asking those questions than any benefit that you may get by, by asking him questions that will be counterproductive. But part of preparation uh, of, 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 of cross-examination includes many things. And for a criminal lawyer, these are non-negotiable things. In a crime, 
it's very, and particularly a crime uh, which, which results in uh, injury, uh, it is very, very important to do a site inspection. I see, I see this is becoming less of a, uh, 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 less of a, uh, we, we just don't have the time to do it, but all the old nuanced lawyers, the legendary lawyers from whom we learned trial, one of the first things they did was do a site inspection and make notes. If the incident was of night, is there enough light? How many shops are there? Is it near the main road? Could it have, could it have been witnessed by persons other than the persons who claim uh, to be eyewitnesses? Was it a desert? Is it a deserted road? Um, is there any way that particular the incident or the narrative? Is there any way the narrative can be contested by your visual inspection of the spot? So spot inspection is a very very important part of your duty when you when it comes to preparing for cross examination. Ask your client every possible information you can get from him about the witness. It is possible he knows nothing, but it is possible he gives you a lot of information. Never underestimate the information that is there in your client's head. And therefore, you must, you must ask him the right questions. In a case which is fairly celebrated, when the, when the accused came to me, one of the first questions I asked her is, did you say this to anyone back then? And she, she hadn't thought about it, but she said, yeah, I did. And I said, well, do you have any evidence to suggest? And she said, yes, there is, there is. And she showed me that evidence. Now, uh, it is amazing that if you start interrogating your own client and asking him questions about the case, how much information you will get and how nuanced your own cross-examination can, can become. In a case where uh, the, the charge is one of uh, a Prevention of Corruption Act, of my client having assets disproportionate to his known sources of income, uh, and the and and and, uh, and uh, you know uh, he's a he's a very well-to-do man um, uh, living in the hills somewhere. Uh, a lot of the information he gave me with respect to his earnings from his various orchards, the number of trees he uh, he has there, the mundies he sent he he sent his fruit to, the kind of earnings he got from there, became relevant for cross-examination because that was information that the prosecution had deliberately by design or otherwise not collected and placed before the court. So your conversation with your client will give you the lead to ask questions to the witness when it comes to, uh, because there are a lot of things you will not know, but your client will know. Why does this man have any kind of animus against you? Why is he making this complaint against you? Is there a history? All of this is important if you have detailed conversations with your client. Challenge him, challenge your client to go and find out more and give you information. Uh, do some kind of a background check, particularly in today's time where you have a different, criminal trials are very different from your typical um, 302 trials that we were used to in the past. Uh, a lot of information is available about witnesses on the net, um, uh, from newspaper cuttings, um, and sometimes uh, you get a bonanza if you do a little bit of research. So all of that becomes important if you do a bit of background check. Information that you know is available, but you don't have it. You use the RTI Act and use it liberally to get that information that then becomes a way to counter the prosecution's narrative and gives, gives way to a very, very effective cross-examination. Uh, so this is the kind of background, uh, background checks, uh, background uh, uh, work that you do. A little, a little tip, today's cases are bulky, mostly. When a witness comes or when a witness is, is supposed to appear the next day, one of the things I tell my office is, take out his 161 statement and tell me, put it in a separate file and give me all the, all the documents that he or she is going to prove and put that along with that uh, uh, 161. 
it just kind of narrows the scope of confusion in your mind and you don't have to you know go through and flip through the entire file narrow it down of course sometimes you might need to be reminded of the testimony of other witnesses who've come before this witness and if something has been said in your favor then you need to flag that in your mind because you don't want to lose ground and you don't want to cede ground because something has already come in your favor. You need to reread that and be careful not to, uh, not to ask too much of what you've gained with the next witness. So maybe a separate file can be created on witness of witnesses who have testified in identical manner uh, prior to this witness. Uh, and then make your list of questions. However prepared you are in structure, and you must be prepared, there are last minute uh, questions that you will ask on the spot. And never be afraid to ask them because sometimes the witness, witness's testimony has not gone to plan. He's saying things that you have, uh, that was not there, that was not before you. Challenge him. It is possible to take risks. Sometimes those risks are counterproductive, but very often those risks are productive. You will know midway through your cross-examination whether you should take that risk or not. Believe me, at my age and at my, at my levels, even now, when I'm taking that risk, I do experience fear. But sometimes the risk needs to be taken and you must take it. It's a decision you have to make in your mind. Uh, how to frame questions. Don't ask long-winded questions, which no one, least of all you, can understand. Uh, ask short questions and get answers. Give him a background, lead him somewhere, make him comfortable, and then ask a question that he least expected you to ask. Uh, you know, again, when you're asking questions, uh, about the scene of crime. You can ask questions on light. You can ask questions of the number of people at the scene of crime, the naturalness of the witness testifying, delay in recording his statement can be put to him. If there's any material he's suppressing, you can ask that, the, that question. And most importantly, if in a, in a, in a trial, uh, in a trial where there are several accused persons, so that in, a, in, a, in a celebrated trial that we completed a couple of years ago, the counsel before me asked a question that um, the witness, and a very eminent witness, the Reserve Bank Governor, had not testified to at all during his examination chief, so therefore that question need not have been, have been asked. Uh, when it was asked, and when it was asked, he got a nice tight slap, he got the answer saying, of course what you're saying is wrong. Of course there was loss. Uh, I was the next, uh, my team was the next in cross-examination and we had to somehow uh, cover up the mistakes. So sometimes you get the opportunity to cover up for the mistakes made by either the counsel before you or the mistake you yourself may have made at an earlier part of cross-examination at a subsequent part. Now this uh, required and I read up about this witness uh, uh, in the past, uh, uh, his testimony, uh, we had read up enough about this witness. He had been a witness in the Joint Parliamentary Committee, JPC of Parliament. We had occasion to look at his testimony there. And we were able to extract from him an answer based on his testimony there, which neutralized the, uh, the stupidity of the question asked by the proceeding cross-examiner. So there are times when you can cover up what the cross-examiner in the past, the mistakes of his, that he's made. There are times when you can cover up your own mistakes. You might get an opportunity, take full use of that opportunity. Um, confrontations. Another very, very important tool of cross-examination. Section 145 of the Indian Evidence Act, read with Section 162 of the, Indian, uh, of the CRPC, is something that all criminal lawyers must know at the back of their hands. It allows you to confront a witness with respect to his previous statement in case there is a contradiction in what he is saying now from what he had said before. 
162 of the uh, Evidence Act, the proviso makes it clear what this is all about, and the explanation defines the contradiction to mean any omission. So if a witness is, is, is saying something which he had not said before, or he's making material omissions, and if you were to read the classic judgment of the Supreme Court called Tehsil Dar Singh versus State, uh, uh, I think it's 1955, it's a constitution bench judgment, it tells you how to confront a witness. Uh, I'll just go through a particular paragraph of the Supreme Court in State of Kerala versus Babu 1999 for SCC 621. Uh, the Supreme Court says, a perusal of this section shows that the section permits the cross-examination of a witness in any trial with respect to his previous statement to establish a contradiction and the manner in which such contradictions can be established. How do you ask? How do you go about doing this? You say, did you give a statement to the police or the investigating agency? Was it on such and such date? Did you in that statement, is it correct that in that statement you had stated X, Y, Z? If he accepts it, the matter ends. You've already established what you, what you sought to establish under Section 145. But if he denies it, if he says, I made no such statement, then it is important for you to confront him with that portion of his previous statement. However, your job doesn't end there. Your job, because he has denied making that, either the statement as a whole or that portion of the statement. That statement is a statement recorded by the police under section 161. When the investigating officer comes to the stand, it is your duty then to ask the investigating officer whether he had correctly recorded that statement because it is he who has recorded that statement. It is only then that the confrontation will be treated as a complete confrontation. And for this, I would request all of you to read V.K. Mishra versus State of Uttarakhand and others, 2015, Volume 9, SCC 588, where the Supreme, and I'll just, I'll just read it, this is important, under Section 145 of the Evidence Act, when it is intended to contradict the witness by his previous statement reduced into writing, the attention of such witness must be called to those parts of it which are used for the purpose of contradicting him before the writing can be used. While recording the deposition of a witness, it becomes the duty of the trial court to ensure that the part of the police statement with which it is intended to contradict the witness is brought to the notice of the witness in his cross-examination. The attention of witness is to be drawn to that part and it must reflect in his cross-examination by reproducing it. If the witness admits the part intended to contradict him, it stands proved and there is no need to further prove, uh, further prove the contradiction. It will be read while appreciating the evidence. If he denies having made that part of the statement, his attention must be drawn to that statement and must be mentioned in the de deposition. By this process, the contradiction is merely brought on record, but it is yet to be proved. Thereafter, when the investigating officer is examined in the court, his attention should be drawn to the passage marked for the purpose of contradiction. It will then be proved in the deposition of the investigating officer, who again, by referring to the police statement, will depose about the witness having made that statement. So your confrontation under 145 is not complete if the witness denies having made the statement till such time that you have that portion of the statement proved by the investigating officer who recorded the statement. That is how it will, the, 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 the confrontation or the contradiction will stand established or proved. Attacking the credibility of witnesses. This is another tool that cross examiners have. Sections 146 and 155 can be, uh, can be referred to for purposes of, of the Indian Evidence Act. Uh, and this tells us uh, in what manner we can ad attack the credibility of the witness. We can, in order to test his veracity, to discover who he is, his position in life, to shake his credit by injuring his character, or the answer to such questions might tend directly or indirectly to incriminate him or might expose or tend directly or indirectly to expose him to a penalty or forfeiture. Likewise, Section 155 specifically allows you to impeach the character of a witness. Uh, uh, the credit of a witness may be impeached in the following ways by the adverse party or with the consent of the court by the party who calls him 
by the evidence of persons who testify that they, from their knowledge of the witness, believe him to be unworthy of credit, so you can call in witnesses, by proof that the witness has been bribed or has accepted a bribe, by proof of former statements inconsistent with any part of his evidence which is liable to be contradicted. Uh, always be mindful of your defense. That's the next part of my uh, address. Uh, very often when I'm doing appeals in the High Court uh, of trials that were done by other counsels, I notice that the, uh, the entire uh, defense of the, of the accused is disjointed. There is no connection. It has no continuity. He's taking one defense at a particular point in time, another defense at a, at a, different, time, a different point in time. Before you commence evidence of the case, I would say at the stage of charge itself, you should have a very good idea about what your defense is going to be. Is it one of denial? Are you going to, are you going to rely on one of the exceptions, on one of the uh, general exceptions uh, of alibi, of insanity, of any other kind of thing? Are you going to rely on any of the special ex exceptions for example, if you are dealing with a case under Section 499 of the IPC, defamation, you have a list of special exceptions. Truth, public interest, pub, uh, uh, these, are all, these are all special exceptions. You should be mindful of, the, of, of one of, the, of these exceptions at the stage at which you are starting. That is, hopefully at the time you get the brief, Certainly, by the time you've argued on charge, you should have your defense firmed up. Otherwise, your entire defense will be jerky, will be unworthy of credence, and will be rejected. So have a consistent line of defense. Your defense, even if it's rejected, must read well. There should be a consistency of pattern, which should be, which should be uh, highlighted through your, uh, your response to the charge, to your cross-examination, every witness must, must fall within the parameters of that defense, to your answers under 313 of the, of, the, of the Code of Criminal Procedure and any defense witness that you may need. There must be a consistency on pattern. Don't change your defense midway. It's a very, very bad idea. Uh, the one way of bringing in your defense, of course, sometimes is through suggestions. Uh, and suggestions are a very, very important tool. One, to discredit the allegations against you, you must give suggestions uh, to discount those allegations. And two, you can put your own case to different witnesses in a suggestive form and bring in witnesses later on who will prove or attempt to prove the suggestions you've given to prosecution witnesses. So suggestions, another important tool in the hands of uh, a cross-examiner. Now, in special acts like the Negotiable Instruments Act, for example, uh, the law is now very clear. Once a notice is framed, in your response to the notice, you have to give your defense. And that's indeed what 251 of the Code of Criminal Procedure is all about. You must say whether you have a defense to make and what that defense is. So I encourage, uh, as far as possible, in cases where it is possible, to not just plead not guilty, but give an indication as to what your defense is. Because when you're doing your final arguments, you can say, I, had this, I, ha I, I, I dealt with this case for 12 years of these young men who were prosecuted under the UAPA Act. And even at a time when they did not have a lawyer, that was at the stage of charge, one of my client, who, whose defense was one of alibi, his defense was that he was in class at his university at the time when the incident took place. On his own, when he was asked to plead guilty or not guilty to the charge, he had insisted that the court put down his, uh, his, his, um, uh, his defense. And so it was, it was against the not, uh, after the not guilty uh, part of, uh, of, uh, of the charge, it was written, I further state that I had nothing to do with the incident. I was in class at such and such a time, at such and such date, when the alleged incident is stated to have uh, taken place. Now that's real consistency for you. Uh, we then took over, that was essentially one major limb of our defense. It was our 
it was it was taken forward in 313 and then we produced defense witnesses from the university to show that he was in class at the time of the incident that's what you call a consistent chain of defense uh, so as far as possible from the stage of notice or charge till the end uh, be mindful of your defense where you're capable of, of, of spelling it out please do so giving the right suggestions as i said is very important but it serves two purposes to refute the prosecution's case specifically through suggestions and to bring in your own uh, your own defense uh, now I'll, I'll come to another portion of cross-examination and that is cross-examination of expert witnesses i did say that section 45 of the of the indian evidence uh, of the indian evidence act talks of expert witnesses now who are these expert witnesses could be forensic experts, could be a, a post-mortem uh, witness. A very different approach uh, is, must, be, um, must be kept in mind, must be taken by you when you cross-examine expert witnesses. Because that witness is not going to fall in to any imaginary theory that you may have to your, in your head. They're expert witnesses. Uh, in cases where your client can afford it, where you're contesting the mode of death, in a murder case, where you're saying that the post-mortem report does not correctly uh, give you the, the manner in which the, accused, uh, the deceased died, it might be worthwhile to engage the services of a retired post-mortem expert, or in the case of a CFL Fessel man, a retired uh, forensic expert, who will take you through the various nuances of the technical and uh, in the case of a post-mortem guy, uh, the medical evidence, something that all of us are not familiar with. We have done that. I've done that on occasion. And I've only been enriched by that process because a lot of the things which I might know generally, uh, I'm not able to uh, crystallize it as a question. And till such time as I sit with a, with, with a post-mortem expert who will say, these are the defects in this, in this uh, document. And this man has not given the right picture. I will not be able to ask the relevant questions. Uh, again, it's important uh, in, in the case of experts, particularly post-mortem doctors, where you're contesting the homicidal nature of, uh, of the evidence and you're saying it was accidental, uh, to put forward the right, uh, the right questions. Uh, Likewise, FSL witnesses, voice samples, handwriting experts, it's always good if you have a backup expert team with you who you can rely on, uh, who can help you through the process because sometimes you yourself are unfamiliar with the science that is being, uh, being contested. Um, in a particular case, uh, we lost it in the Supreme Court, uh, it was it was it was a it was a case in which the uh, DNA evidence was being contested, but unfortunately, uh, nothing had been asked of the DNA witness at the time of trial. Uh, what had happened was when we looked at the evidence, we we realized that a particular exhibit, which was sent for DNA comparison, what was recovered was a, ske a skeleton of a child. And uh, the mother of the child had, had given her DNA to try and prove that this was her child. Uh, the, uh, the, even the skeleton was actually uh, in a crumbled state. It was sent to a particular laboratory, which is India's celebrated laboratory in Hyderabad. And the Hyderabad people, it appears, looked at it and said, we can't extract enough from this for purposes of her DNA comparison. Now, the prosecution hid that and took that skele skeletal remains or whatever else to another laboratory in its own state and got a perfect DNA match. At the Supreme Court level, uh, the advocates on record uh, moved RTIs and it was, it was pretty clear what had happened. It was, we were able to establish that the DNA sample sent to uh, uh, the Hyderabad laboratory uh, could not be examined because of the insufficiency of material. Uh, now the challenge was, 
We had not asked any questions in trial. This was a state matter. It had come from Chhattisgarh. Uh, not a remote, uh, we, we had not invoked our rights for further examination in the High Court. In the Supreme Court, how do you get a court to listen to evidence which is, which is there, which will, which will help your client uh, uh, get past the charge, but this is not the court which is supposed to take original evidence. Um, we tried, uh, we succeeded with the ad uh, admission court, but we lost uh, finally when we, uh, when we argued it finally. Uh, so these are, these are little things that we should be careful about. Never accept a story, Con challenge and contest every story. You might get something, you might get nothing. But it was, it, it was something which made us suspicious that a sample is going to laboratory A and then we hear nothing about it. And suddenly a report is coming from laboratory B and the prosecution is absolutely silent about the journey between A and B. It ought to have uh, challenged the cross-examiner. He ought to have put questions and probed deeper into it. It was not done. It was not done at the first appellate stage. By the time it came to SLP, it was too late and the client paid for the sins of the lawyer. Uh, so it's extremely important to look at details and cross-examination is all about details. Uh, as I said, use of RTIs for determining. Um, now, uh, uh, another, another area where you can use RTIs, for example, a lot of cases today, including murder cases, are cracked on the basis of uh, uh, um, phone conversations. This person was talking to this person at such and such a uh, time. And it is determined that if I'm an accused, I was present at uh, gate number five at the Delhi High Court on such and such date at such and such time. Now, if I were to, typically speaking, pro the prosecution is hesitant to place on record tower locations. And if they haven't, and I am saying to my lawyer, I was not present there, I was miles away, then it is incumbent on my lawyer to ask for tower locations. And there is a period within which you have to ask, otherwise these, this evidence gets destroyed. And keep it on the court record. So again, as I said, your conversation with your client and your ultimate defense should have been nuanced very early on because otherwise you don't get an opportunity to preserve evidence which will otherwise be lost. Uh, there are, uh, uh, I'm coming to the end of my, uh, uh, end of my talk, but I, I will not, it will not be complete if I don't highlight one aspect of criminal trials where there is an embargo on asking certain questions. And these are with respect to sexual offenses, rape and such like offenses. Uh, as you know, the criminal law amendment bill was passed by the criminal law. Sections 53A, 114A, and sections 146 have all been amended and in, or inserted. 53A is an insertion. Uh, essentially, what it says is that in cases of, um, of sexual violence, uh, where the question of consent is an issue, evidence of the character of the victim of, or of such person's previous sexual experience with any person shall not be relevant on the issue of such consent or the quality of consent. Almost the same thing has been uh, inserted in section 140, 114A. And in 146, a proviso has been inserted where, again, questions relating to a victim's past sexual history is not prohibited, but uh, has been discouraged. Uh, it is for courts, therefore, to ensure that those questions are not asked. So these are those uh, cases, these are those exceptions in criminal law where you cannot impeach the character of the prosecutrix based on her past sexual history, because that's irrelevant to the crime. And therefore, a specific embargo has been brought and the cross-examiner cannot therefore, in view of sections uh, 53A, 114A and 146, ask those questions. Uh, I will end by, uh, by, uh, 
by saying a few things, which will basically tie up this whole thing. I said, I've been repeatedly saying that cross-examination is not a standalone stage. Let me quickly take you through a criminal trial, maybe of the highest magnitude, a murder case. Your client is arrested, he's remanded. And after his first remand, he comes to you and, he's, and in court he says, I was beaten up and they made me sign up a whole lot of uh, papers. It is your duty to file an application before the court, bringing it to the notice of the court. That confessional statements were extracted from my client under duress, and I'm stating so on instructions from my client. Test identification parade, again happens during the first 60 or 90 days of investigation. Very often, and this has happened to me, I have been informed either directly by the client or through his perocar, that he was shown to a variety of uh, people who were made to look at him, and therefore he is not consenting to a test identification parade. Now, it's important to bring this on record. Therefore, it's not enough to deny the TIP. It's important to give a reason. And again, I go back to that case of 12 years where this, uh, this young student treated alibi at a stage where he was unrepresented, he got the court to write that he was shown to the uh, person who ultimately turned out to be the eyewitness in the case. And he described that person from his spectacles to the length of his hair, to his height, to the color of his skin, and to his bodily weight. And said, so this man was repeatedly shown to me while I was in police custody. We made use of that in cross-examination. So, it is, important, uh, it is important for us to be engaged at every stage. The stage of remand is a very, very important stage. These elements where you have to give your consent for voice sample, where you have to give your handwriting, where you're, where you're being given, asked to give your consent for a test identification parade, your personal liberty is being compromised with. And therefore, unless procedural law is followed to the hilt, you must bring it to the notice of the court through an application that these, these things happen to me and that is the reason why I am uh, not, uh, not agreeing to a TIP or why uh, a particular statement was taken under duress from me. It will then be very easy for you to connect the dots when you cross-examine either the eyewitness or the investigating officer. Because it's, it's the consistency. You said it at the first available opportunity and you're saying it consistently right through the end. Uh, so I conclude by saying that cross-examination can be jerky, it can be elegant. Uh, even if the case is not elegant. Uh, it should be our attempt to try and make the cross-examination as consistent, as seamlessly uh, 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 effective as possible. Uh, we should rely on, uh, on a trial is, 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 is like a piece of art. And I will do a trial any day before appellate work because I think you can put together so many challenging elements to and make it one holistic case. And a well done trial is far more satisfying than an appeal that you may have won in the High Court of the Supreme Court. And in any case, the appeal that you win in the High Court of the Supreme Court is based on the structure, the bricks and the bolts and the nuts of the trial that, that was conducted. If that was strong, if that was robust, your appeal will be robust. Always remember, you're dealing with civil liberty and you're dealing with the rights of individuals. It's not our place to contest whether he or she did the crime. It's not for us to challenge that, but procedure established by law must at all times be, be, uh, be uh, given credence to. And we as defense lawyers, we are the last bastions of freedom. We must ensure that we do our work with as much clinical precision as possible. Thank you very much.
also request Justice. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Justice uh, Pratibha Singh would also, if you could please address us with a few words. Uh, and Justice Kohli, would you, ma'am, if you need to leave right now, um, we, uh, we thank you very much for being here and joining us. Thank you. If I can quickly um, uh, exit, I'm so sorry. There are some administrative things that I'm occupied with right now. So I uh, must thank Rebecca for such an exhaustive uh, uh, description of how to uh, take a matter and structure the case right from the grassroots and take it right to the <clears throat> Supreme Court. And what is important is how you leave the evidence and, and all the details relating to it. So uh, I'll thank Rebecca and uh, all of you who have been here to uh, hear Rebecca. And I hope you take away a lot of it. I leave the I leave this uh, uh, meeting and uh, request Pratibha to take over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Hi, very good evening to all of you. Um, Hima ma'am who's just left. Rekha, I'm not sure if she's there. Tara Kadambri, Manisha, it's wonderful to be back into the wind family as I call it. And Rekha, thank you so much for the wonderful and exhaustive uh, explanation of cross-examination in criminal trials. Because uh, I've never done a criminal trial and I can see the complete difference between uh, cross-examination in civil and commercial matters and uh, and the criminal trials. Um, uh, hello audience, I think there's a huge audience which is listening to this and uh, watching us and uh, the best way you can uh, spend during the lockdown is by learning and honing your skills and uh, listening to Rebecca was indeed a great pleasure thank and thank you for inviting me. I would just like to add a few things. Um, I'm not sure there may be many practitioners who do civil and Cross exam and uh, you know commercial matters as well. From a judge's perspective, uh, what what does a judge need when he or she is looking at a cross examination that has already taken place? There are a few things which I would think equally apply to criminal trials as well as civil trials. The first and the foremost thing is we have a practice in the trial courts where the steno primarily is transcribing in his own words whatever uh, is being said by the witness. And I think it's important that lawyers pay very detailed attention to what is being written by the steno. Because it's being transcribed in the steno's or the counsel's own words, but the witness may be saying something in Hindi or a better word could be used. And those words can have a very important significance when it's being read again in the first appellate uh, stage. Because uh, steno's and lawyers have their own way of retranscribing things when that may not be the actual uh, word used by the steno, used by the witness. So if possible, you can add one or two words in Hindi in brackets to just give a feel to the judge about what was the exact word which the witness used. That would help the judge in a manner. Uh, you know, till uh, I would think the ideal way would be to actually have transcriptions of the evidence which is recorded both video and audio, so that the judge can actually take a look at it at some point. But so long as, uh, you know, judges get a flavor of the cross-examination, we have to do good with the current system because as you may all uh, experience, the judge recording the evidence need not be the judge deciding the case finally. So that gap needs to be uh, maintained and be conscious of when you record. And at the end of the day, sign the transcript of the evidence and the testimony. So that's one major thing which I think I need to say as a tip for everybody who is recording evidence and cross-examination. The second thing I would like to say is that uh, whenever you have to cross-examine a witness, try and make the witness very relaxed and comfortable. I'm not sure if that's possible in a criminal trial, but I've realized in civil trials, for example, uh, partition suits, and uh, matrimonial cases, or even in commercial matters, if you notice the demeanor of the witness, the way he or she is sitting in the court, the way he or she is interacting with others, with the lawyer, etc., etc., you will pick up a lot of uh, tips. So, therefore, 
it is worthwhile spending maybe half an hour or one hour before the cross examination or the actual record of evidence begins in the court to observe the witness it's very important to observe the witness try and observe as much as you can about what the witness is how he or she is what is his body language what is the way he or she is expressing things generally in the courtroom it can give you an idea as to what kind of a person it is who is being cross examined the third thing i would like to say is of course in civil cases i have noticed that while the uh, you know the actual case pleaded on the on the record is something the real truth is actually something else i remember there was this case where there was an old man uh, who had about three daughters and two sons and there was a property dispute he was trying to get one of the sons evicted from the property uh, one of the floors from one of the floors of the property the daughters had already given a no objection in the partition suit and the grandfather i mean the father said i don't want him i don't like him i don't want him to have any share and then when he was cross examined or when he was called to the court with a little bit of probing it was realized that he actually liked the son whom he was trying to evict but his real problem was the son's son who was creating a ruckus every night by bringing friends there and holding a party there every day and drinking with his friends etc so the minute the old man was cross examined we could it was realized that the purpose for which he had filed the partition suit was to teach his grandson a lesson rather than any tiff with the son himself so the minute you address that problem the whole problem got resolved so the truth is something contrary that is pleaded and that you can actually arrive at the truth and the matter got finally settled instead of going into cross examination and final judgment so most of the times the truth is something beyond what is pleaded in the in the court the other thing that i would like to say about cross examination is lawyers who start the cross examination should know the five or six things they want to elicit from a witness and then you can decide on the path to go about that because if you don't know where the cross examination you are leading it to you are likely to lose your way or get entrapped into the witness's own you know testimony which may not be suitable and may be contrary to your own client's interest so always have the path and the final you know the destination etched in your mind so that you know the path that you need to adopt in civil cases i notice that when local commissioners are recording evidence there are bigger issues uh, it's it's a problem that uh, demeanor of witnesses is not getting noticed so please insist if a witness is taking too long to answer a question every question you ask it may be 3 hours of cross examination you've just done 10 questions and then you realize that the witness is actually kind of not even answering what you're asking so you need to then get the demeanor of the witness recorded so that the person or the appellate judge or the revisional court who is looking at it gets an idea that the witness is wasting the time unless the demeanor is recorded local commissioners evidence can be a problem because objections are not decided by local commissioners and this is a major thing that we are fi- facing in civil and commercial matters where commissioners are appointed for record of evidence and lastly sometimes it helps to kind of keep a note of what the witness is doing uh, i recall one specific case where it was a patent matter where an uncomfortable question was put to the witness just before 1 o'clock and the witness and the local commissioner suddenly the local commissioner said okay i have to leave he'll answer after lunch and it was a very uncomfortable question to the witness and as a cross examining counsel the counsel realized that you know it's possible that this man will discuss it with his you know uh, superiors or the lawyers and etc so it was a it was a foreign witness so as soon as the reassembly of the witness took place the first question the lawyer put was did you discuss this with your legal manager who was present with you so the witness got got completely ruffled at that stage because he didn't want to lie and he almost got pinned down so the minute you ask that question he has to answer yes or no and he answered yes so his credibility took a very big beating at that stage so sometimes these thinking on the feet kind of questions do help in uh, cross examination and i think that the fact that you're all learning so much during this uh, 
period. And I don't know, I expect that because this is a will forum, there will be a lot of women who are uh, listening to this, all the women lawyers. I'm sure your burdens have been, uh, your burden has been increased during the lockdown. You don't get your housemaids, you don't get your cooks. You must be doing a lot of work. And the fact that you're participating in this shows that you're committed to your profession. And Rebecca, thank you for the wonderful uh, uh, exposition on criminal trials. I really made a lot of notes and learned a lot. And uh, it's, um, it's nice to meet all of you. Um, the organizers of Will, thank you for taking this forward. And please continue to do this. I think we can do webinars even after court reopen because, because it's not possible to physically have people all the time present and from their own homes or offices. If they're willing to join like this, I think it's a great occasion to meet. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, thank you so much for having me on this. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now can I request uh, uh, Ms. Manindra Acharya to give us the vote of thanks, please? Well, it was a very, very exhaustive and enlightening address. I first, before thanking anybody else, I must thank Rebecca for taking out time, preparing this exhaustive address on criminal trials. When Kadambri first discussed me with, uh, with me on the topics, I said we must have a webinar on the skill of cross exam. Because once I had heard justice, we had done this on the civil law side, and we had heard Justice Endlaw, Justice Ashutosh, and one foreign speaker speak on it. And that experience had really stayed with me because it actually is a great skill, the trial. And especially the lawyers today, nowadays, don't get exposed to it so much, more so those who are practicing in the high court. Unless you go to the trial court, you've been exposed to the trial court practice. You don't get exposed to. When we were growing up, trials used to take place in the high court also. But nowadays, it's only either before the commissioners or very rarely before the courts. So it was very enlightening address by Rebecca. I must thank Rebecca. I must thank Justice Pratibha Singh, Justice Himakoli for having taken out time during the COVID-19 break. I'm sure both uh, of the honorable judges must be having a lot of other work to do, but they still took out time and participate in this webinar. My heartfelt thanks to them. I must thank uh, Tara, Kalam. Hello, Maninda. Sorry, I missed your name. No, no, that's all right. I didn't know you were there. That's all right. So I must thank Kadambri, Tara, Manisha, their associates, all those who made this possible. And it was a great experience. And we must have now another one on the same topic in civil <laughs> law. Because yes. it will have different nuances. And I won't take much time, but I'll just share one small experience. Once I, was, I had to do a matter in which uh, the client, uh, my client was from abroad and he had told me that come what may, I will not lie. So don't just tutor me, I will speak whatever is the truth. And we had some case where we had, actually my client had supplied some scrap to an Indian buyer, but since it was not allowed to actually import scrap, it had been described under some name. When it reached, the custom authorities raised a question and ultimately the scrap could not come in. So my client was facing a suit for recovery because the payments had been made. And my client was saying that you asked me to describe the goods as, as A, so I described it as A. But you very well knew that you were buying scrap and the underlying risks were yours. So when, we, when I went for the cross-examination of the other side, I was actually very scared because I knew my client will not speak anything which is not the truth. And I remember there was this additional district judge, Justice Mr. Rathi. I was appearing before him and I told him, it was, I was just four years in the profession. So I told him, I don't know much of the trial. And if I go wrong, please help me. So he says, you carry on. So I asked him the question. Um, there was this officer from the company who had come. So I asked him, uh, so what do you know about this whole issue? I showed him some documents. He said, I know nothing because I was not in the company at that relevant time. So for, a mo for some moments, I just stopped. And then I looked at Mr. Rathi, the learned ADJ, thinking that he'll give me some hint because my gut feeling said that now I should not ask any further question and I should rest my case there. And then 
I just took the courage and I said, I don't want to ask any further question. Mm. Because if you have no knowledge, you've not gone through the records. If you were not in the company at that time. So this is what is the trial all about. Sometimes the advocacy of silence is more important than what you speak. So it was a very, very enlightening lecture by Rebecca. I once again thank her and thank all the organizers. And I thank again the honorable judges to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Acharya. Thank you for being here with us. Um, I, I see that we have quite a few questions on, uh, there's a chat group uh, on the side and I'm sure um, the um, audience would also like to ask questions. So if it's okay with you, Ms. John, I, I can start the question and answer session. Do we have the time? Uh, yes, as far as uh, if if everybody is okay, we can. Um, can I request Mega please to uh, enable ask uh, to enable people's videos and whoever would like to ask a question, can I request you to enable your videos? Yes. So we have time, ma'am. It's up to you. If it's okay with everybody, we can. Um, if there are there have been a few, uh, there have been a few questions. People have already asked about uh, half a dozen questions. Um, I can start with the, the first one, which came from uh, somebody called One Plus Seven. Could you please tell us who you are and ask your question? I'm I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I think, uh, ma'am. I think I might have to just uh, Mega. Can we unmute everybody now, or is it going to create too much chaos? I just intervene. Um, yes. Uh, one of our friends called Angad Kamat had asked a question, Tanvi had asked a question yes. and Masika had asked a question. If they so, want to one by one unmute themselves uh, as well as their video. Angad okay. Kamat. Yeah. Uh, Everyone else can keep themselves on mute for the time being. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Are you, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, thank you for such an enriching talk. My question relates to the consent defense in rape cases. I know that the consent defense in rape cases is a highly complicated affair. So essentially as defense counsel, you want to elicit answers which probabilize, probabilize the defense that you take. And the defense is brought about through your suggestion. So how do you, uh, how do you raise questions and questions necessarily will have to be, I mean, facts are implied from the answers which are elicited. So how do you ask questions which don't affect the character of the woman? That's essentially the question that I have. Okay, so I think it's very important for everyone to actually, these are not brilliantly um, amended sections. Huh? So I think it's important for everyone to read uh, these sections. And there's a catch there. And you can easily- Rebecca, Rebecca, sorry. I'm just intervening. I don't want to disturb. I'm taking leave. See you all. Okay. Bye. The program. Bye, bye. Bye. bye, bye. I'll also take leave. See you all. Thank you, organizers. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So if you were to, can I answer, Angad? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So if you were to see 53A, you see this, uh, where the question, if you were to strictly read the section, uh, where the question of consent is an issue. Now, if you're denying the incident, when the question of consent is where you are accepting that it was a consensual relationship. Yeah, so the defense that if I'm you asking, if you so the application of that embargo is only when the issue of consent is an issue. Firstly, that. Secondly, your question is, and I understand the predicament that if you cannot ask about uh, if 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 you if you cannot ask about uh, the previous sexual history of the woman, how do you discredit her? My answer is both as a lawyer and as a feminist. In a case where uh, a woman is alleging rape, uh, surely there are ways in which, I mean, if you're saying that she's made a false allegation against you. To say, to plead false allegation, you don't necessarily have to ask about her previous sexual history. That is irrelevant to the facts of your case. But you can ask, for example, there was a case in which she had made, a woman had made similar allegations against another man. And that ended in an acquittal. So while you don't have to ask about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that she was in a relationship with that man, you can certainly say, is it correct that you got FIR number so-and-so registered? 
Is it correct that in that FIR, so-and-so was an accused? Is it correct that such and such case ended in an acquittal and this is the judgment? And you can exhibit a certified copy of the judgment. So it is just the way you nuance your cross-examination. You don't just have to, you don't have to ask these millions of questions. Were you in relationship with person X? Were you in relationship with person Y? That doesn't in any way enhance your case. Uh, but when you make those suggestions, let's assume that the man was seduced into um, having intercourse. So how do you make suggestions then in a way which... I think men are seduced into having intercourse, as I don't think so. But anyway, if that's your experience, uh, then uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll have to say that somebody, that that person is falsely implicating you. And that... She was, so there's no, there's no harm in saying that she, you were in a voluntary relationship with each other. Seduction, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how you are going to frame that as a question. Can we move to the next question, ma'am? Uh, so, Tanvi, had, uh, Tanvi and Malvika had asked, Malvika had asked, in ki, uh, Malvika, can you hear us? Hi, I can. Yeah, if you can re repeat your question for ma'am. To read it out, um, and this is from practical experience. But in cases where um, certain relevant information or document is confidential, secret, or classified for whatever reason, especially in cases that come under the Official Secrets Act, and certain information is kept outside, how, as a defense lawyer, would you then charge and then? Tanvi, could you repeat the question? Can't hear her. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in midst of a cross examination, if we realize that we ask something instantly, the answer to which is not turning out to be in our favor, and we may fall in the prosecution trap. So, how can we cover up uh, immediately? Ma'am, there are two questions here. One yeah, from Tanvi. We swiftly move from Official Secrets Act to uh, the error we've committed. I'll answer the second one first. See, there are no, uh, this is really learn on the job. I can't really say how do you, how do you, so what, um, uh, what was said just now by Justice Pratibha Singh is actually very, very, very relevant. Uh, hmm. As a cross-examiner, you must have the structure of what is it that you at the very least want from this witness? One, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, and try and keep your, keep your uh, cross-examination structured. I know a lot of traditional criminal lawyers like to keep it unstructured. They'll go from one end to the other end and hope at some stage the witness will collapse. I'm not one of those people. I prefer to keep my cross-examination structured. I prefer to put, uh, 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 put questions which I think uh, the witness will not have an escape from answering. In the event I feel that an answer which is slightly uncomfortable to me has come, I will then mm -hmm. not take forward that line of questioning. I will stop, minimize the damage at the first instance. And these are things that you pick up on your feet while you are cross-examining the witness. As was said very rightly, you have to be very attentive. You have to judge your witness. You must know whether the witness is capable of giving an answer which is not entirely convenient to you. If you make that assessment, you will probably make, you will minimize the number of mistakes you make. Look, all of us make mistakes. Cross-examination essentially means that there will be mistakes you have made. So don't, don't get scared of that. But you minimize the mistake. And certainly, there are some areas that you must never, never touch because you know the answer will kill you. So don't ask those questions. And just put it in a suggestive form. One way of escaping is you put the question in a suggestive form and not ask a direct question. Okay. And ma'am, in case it's an expert witness, as you had uh, said when you were explaining that topic, so suppose something which you derive from uh, the expert witness testimony, uh, you are not aware of those facts. Maybe it might be something medical or something regarding forensic, which you are not that into it because it's not your subject. So how do you tackle with it uh, at that moment? If you had, uh, yeah. So, you know, um, tackle it at that moment is not what I would like young lawyers to do. I would like the structure of your cross-examination to be ready before the moment. So if you're dealing with a... 
an expert witness, a witness mm -hmm. who knows far more than you do in his field. Okay, uh, it is always, as I said, what we've increasingly begun to do now, uh, mm -hmm. if if permitted by the client and if his finances permit, uh, is to take help from other expert witnesses retired people who offer their services for a price, where you say that this is the report, read it and tell us what is wrong. Some of it is instinctive. It comes, from, it comes to you from experience. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have forensic witnesses who are proving your voice sample, saying that the sample matches the uh, incriminating voice. Now, mm -hmm. uh, there are small things that you have to look into. What are the, what are the uh, how did the seizure take place? How did the seizure and the sealing take place? That took place somewhere mm -hmm. else. What is, what is sent to the forensic witness? What, do they contain the same seals? When was it open? Was there something written on it which is not written in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, packet which is open in court? These are things, in, in a case which I'm presently doing of some um, uh, relevance, uh, the witness hasn't come, but what we found is uh, what was seized is not what was examined. And you can make that out from a series of, tra of from the trail of evidence. And therefore, it will be very easy for us to break the expert witness when she comes to court, because what was seized was not what she examined. So we don't know what was examined and what was sent to her. Correct. The idea is to create reasonable doubt. True. Question. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, ma'am. That answered. Uh, Malvika's question got left out, and there are two more on the chat window. One is uh, in cases where certain relevant information document is confidential slash secret or classified and cannot be revealed, especially in view of statutes like the Official Secrets Act. How does one build her defense and conduct examination of evidence? Okay, so you'll have to move an application. Depends on really uh, the the ex the nature of the secret. It and it depends from court to court. Uh, some questions are prohibited if you don't have access to that material. But you can certainly move an application before the court saying, I would require these documents to be, to be brought. It can be placed in court custody. It can be opened during the time of cross-examination, but I need to confront the witness with these documents. It's really a question of what you know for sure exists on the record which the prosecution is concealing, but because of the sensitive nature of that evidence, it is not brought on record and will never be brought voluntarily. You need to, exp you need to put it on application and summon that. Invoke section 91 as much as possible. Invoke section 311 as much as possible. You'll find an answer to most situations. Archit Krishna wanted to ask a question. Sorry, uh, sorry, Megha, before we do that, can we please have Malvika who's been waiting to ask a question? This was, this was Malvika's question. Questions as okay. okay. Archit, do you want to ask the question quickly? Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Yes. Ma'am, uh, in a given case, if in a given case, uh, we don't have a defense in the, in the initial stage of the case then how do we approach to uh, towards the witnesses how do we approach in a cross examination because we, we don't have a defense in our mind I completely understand your predicament in many cases we are in a defenseless situation uh, where uh, where there is nothing you know um, see so the as i said the, you have all these tools which i mentioned and there'll be many many more tools which i have not mentioned and people more skilled than me you have uh, will will be using you have to dig into one of these and try and try to get something out. Uh, very often when you have uh, ocular evidence, strong eyewitness testimony, and the eyewitness hasn't shaken, huh? uh, it's very difficult then, and especially if the eyewitness is, say, the mother or the father of the, of, of the deceased, and the eyewitness is stuck to the, uh, to the testimony, it's very, very difficult to cross-examine. So your cross-examination would be peripheral, your cross-examination would be suggestive, and really 
there are times where I feel as helpless as your situation, where you really can't extract very much. But then those cases happen. I mean, uh, it's not like we, we are magicians. We can only play with a set of facts and with a set of existing facts. Um, uh, so uh, if, if those are not available, uh, and despite the, the, the way we've looked at the record with a fine uh, tooth comb, uh, we don't find any discrepancy, then that is, that is what it is. We can't, we can't help it. Uh, we can only do the best we can with the tools which are available with us. Unfortunately, we don't make use of all those tools is what I have been trying to say. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, there are a few on the chat window which I can read up uh, quickly. Uh, Sneha LK has asked an instance of a witness who is working in the capacity of an expert but hasn't been brought to the court as an expert per se. Would such an opinion in the chief or cross be liable to be admitted or can the same be objected to? This is one. What? Sorry, repeat that question. Witness has not been brought to court. Would such opinion... Expert witness has not been brought to court. Yes, yes. Although the, although the document has been exhibited. Why? Well, you can... You can uh, you what I mean by the question is that uh, if a person hasn't been brought as an expert to the court per se, but the capacity that they're working in, the profession that they're working in, they are an expert in that particular field. And would their be opinion considered as an expert opinion? Oh, in that? oh I see. Not, so uh, what you're trying to say is not the person who has actually conducted the, say, yes, exactly. yes, or, yes. Or, but somebody else who is reading into some no so that, that's that's that that, that, that can be uh, contested in cross examination uh, because although you're an expert you're an expert to what you have seen and what you have uh, what you've heard and uh, and this is one level removed from that person albeit he or she is an expert so that can certainly be contested you have not conducted the cross examination mm -hmm. you have not conducted the um, the uh, the post mortem you have not had the uh, benefit of seeing the body and the injuries of the body so all of those questions can be asked and that will definitely uh, negate the uh, the relevance and quality of the evidence given Again, ma'am, I just wanted to say thank you. It was a very, very informative uh, little conference and meeting. Uh, thank you. So, thank you very much. And I have just one more question, if, if I uh, could. Uh, if, uh, I, I wanted to ask if there is a POXA trial that is being conducted. Uh, any points that you can give for conducting cross-examination in uh, that particular area? Um, because I feel it's, it's based. Based. I mean, you know, these are situation based. So I would really like to stick my neck out and say something which may not prove productive. <laughs> uh, you'll have to, you know, these, the whole idea of this, of this webinar was to, uh, was to say, uh, you know, this is the limit. The sky is the limit. You can, you can tap into all these areas and empower yourself, but not specifically. Uh, I wouldn't really like to jump in and say something which may not be relevant to the facts of the case. Certainly. Thank you again. Thank you. We'll take two more questions, ma'am, for the day then. Uh, Govin, Mewar uh, next, and after that, Hamza. Uh, Govin, hi, ma'am. Hi, ma'am. Yeah, this is Keeti. I'm sorry, my name is appearing to be somebody else's. Uh, my dad's basically. Yeah. So uh, I just wanted to ask that in case uh, when ma'am you suggested that. Uh, we can ask as suggestions. So what do we do when we, we see that there's a tendency when we ask questions as suggestions, it is normally answered that it is incorrect, it is correct. So how do we take out answers uh, from the witnesses to that? Because even the stenos, if we ask it, is, is it as a suggestion, they tend to write it is correct, it is incorrect, that's about it. They, do, they don't allow... You know, the suggestion is incorrect or correct. No? So yeah, that's about it. Point? So the, uh, most of the time, the stenos don't allow the witness to add on to it. So that is my personal experience. The volunteered portion. Yeah, volunteered portion. And even... Okay, so this, yeah. is a, this, this volunteering is something which is very peculiar to the Indian judicial system. It's not really... Uh, I've never seen it across any other jurisprudences across the world. Uh, we, this is something we have developed that it will not come in the answer, but it'll come as a volunteered portion. Um, well, uh, very many courts allow witnesses to volunteer uh, and, and give a clarification. Um, uh, but you can stick your neck out and say that everything I'm asking, she or he doesn't have to volunteer. So really, it's, it's, a, it's a very aggressive adversarial engagement between 
you, the witness, the court, and the prosecutor. And uh, it's a test of your energy and your skills. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Hamza, next, quickly, and this is the last question for the day. Yes. Hi, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for taking all the time. It has been very uh, helpful. Uh, I just wanted to ask if someone is really starting out in uh, litigation, like I'm a student right now, I've just started working. What would be the few foundational uh, things to learn? Because much of what has been discussed today is something that people uh, require after a reasonable amount of time in trial. What would be the key focus areas that help someone become a very good cross-examiner? As a student? Uh, as, as someone who wishes to practice further. So, uh, you know, it's a, um, I don't know whether I'll sound a little, um, a little arrogant, I don't mean to, um, but this is, um, law is actually a long journey. And uh, to be a well-rounded, nuanced lawyer takes time. And I'm very happy that a student of law is interested in asking these questions. It didn't come, none of this came to us as students. We were, you were at least at, attending a webinar. I can't remember doing anything remotely connected to the law when I was a law student. Um, it will come, it will come with observing others. I think young lawyers should invest time in observing seniors, being part of cases with their seniors, seeing that journey. And if you see one such journey, you will be very, very richly empowered at the end of that experience. We learned that way. It took a long time. Um, I'm sure you'll also learn. You're much smarter than we were. Uh, so all you need to is invest some bit of your time with somebody who has the skills and be part of the journey of a trial. If you're part of that journey, many of these questions that you're asking today will fall into place and you will be able to find answers yourself. Um, thank you, yes, ma'am. Ma thank seeing, you so uh, much, ma'am. There's just one more person who's uh, consistently raising her, his hand. Jawahar yeah. wants to ask. Jawahar, Raja, I can see it here. What does he want? Yeah, please he let him ask. Really ask. <laughs> uh, thank, thanks so much. Thanks so much. As always, listening to you is very productive. I was wondering if uh, after this, we, if you wanted to um, follow up on this, is there a book, any other resource, video resources that we can... Uh, go back to that will be productive uh, if we were to study. And if there isn't a book or video resources, is there a case, maybe a historical case, which you think will be useful for someone to study? Maybe uh, uh, we can have another webinar where we can have you take us through maybe an important case, maybe uh, the Rajiv Gandhi murder trial, maybe the Indira Gandhi murder trial. Um, do you think that would be useful and, and productive? Uh, is there something that we can do to, because much of what you told us is very useful, but I think maybe our questions and our uh, uh, interaction may be even more productive if we had the, if you were to apply our mind to the specifics of why we did this and why we didn't do that. So you and I have done some interesting cases together. You choose the case, we'll do it. <laughs> no, I think it's a, yeah. you see, I think it's a very good, um, a very good suggestion. It'll make it more, uh, more relevant when you have an actual case, when you have actual facts, uh, when you have actual statements and you have actual cross-examination. Mm. Uh, I think, uh, I think it, it really increases the nuance of the whole procedure. And uh, sure, I'm sure Tara and all will, uh, will look into it. We can, we can do a, we can do a case-wise, um, uh, a, a case study, you know, from beginning to end. Um, I have some cases in mind, I'm sure all of you also. And you know, why, uh, why particular defenses were taken at particular points of time, um, the consistency of that defense, why a particular question was asked, how do they tie it up with a, with a later stage, etc. Um, it's, it's, it's a, but it, it has to be a far more, uh, it has to be a longer session, it has to be, we need more tools to put up, statements, cross-examination. I think we all need the same kind of material before us. Sure, we can do that. We can think of that. Thank you. I think we can do a moot uh, cross-examination, uh, perhaps. A moot um, cross-examination. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think what Jawahar said was that uh, at the back of a, of, a, of a webinar like this, if we can then take up a real case, yes. right, and which, is, which has concluded, uh, and, and go through the journey of that case. Um, it's more like, uh, it'll be more like a classroom experience where people have to read those materials. But yes, that can be very interesting. 
yes ma'am i agree with you it will make it uh, much more interactive as well and the mood suggestion we may not all be able to be in the same room at present yeah. or even close to each other but at least we can uh, like you said prepare and then uh, then come up um uh, i think uh, i we've taken up a lot of your time i'm sorry i don't know if there are any other questions but uh, can i just ask kadambri to finally do the uh, vote of thanks please <laughs> so this is uh, the second vote of thanks we are uh, doing for you ma'am and and i think you deserve much more <laughs> many times over thank you for a time like this to have to meet colleagues again and to see that everybody is well i think we should be grateful and thankful uh, and uh, wonderful meeting everybody uh, i hope we'll continue to do that and i hope we meet each other in person sooner rather than later <laughs> and uh, we have in fact so many requests uh, from participants who could not join in so we are telling them they are asking whether there's a recording whether we'll do a repeat show so i said okay hold on let's get over with this one and definitely for the next one we will be better prepared with more participation space and all of that so this time we thought 100 was a lot we could handle but uh, uh, well i think it's much exceeded the number and uh, i we sincerely thank you for being there and such a long intensive and you know not even a moment where we felt uh, that we were losing interest you know everything was so interesting so thank you so much once again ma'am uh, thank you can i just say one last thing i think this couldn't have been i mean there were there were glitches we couldn't do the last one properly and even this we were exploring how far we could go but i think we i have to thank tara kadambari and uh, from the bottom of my heart because you know they didn't even at ta various times at night these messages kept going back and forth to make this as interactive and as productive as possible so if somebody needs to be thanked it's kadambari and and tara who really put this together motivated us and made sure that we sat on time and did things on time thank you very much thank you so much ma'am thanks thank to you. all the participants thank you all the participants yes. thank, thank you tara and kadambari thank, thank you, you manisha thank, thank you, you.